In the previous video we went over a rather technical mathematical derivation of the continuity equation and this derivation involved in a rather essential way uh, manipulations with the various operators. The appearance of operators is actually not specific to uh, the particular problem of continuity equation, but uh, they appear actually throughout quantum mechanics and play a very important role generally in the math mathematical formalism of quantum physics. In this short video I would like to uh, make a few general comments about operators and relate them to uh, quantum observable quantities. So, in order for me to trace uh, the origin of the operator objects in quantum theory, let us uh, go back a little bit and remind ourselves uh, the way uh, the Schrodinger equation was derived. So, I use derived here in quotes because there is no really rigorous way to derive the Schrodinger equation as a fundamental equation of quantum theory, but we sort of follow the logic that the early practitioners uh, such as Schrodinger used. And the first piece of information, uh, which was essential, was uh, the, the experimental fact that quantum electrons and other quantum particles may exhibit wave-like properties. And uh, in, in order to explain this, uh, we sort of introduce in an ad hoc fashion a plane wave uh, function, which would explain the data, essentially. And uh, in this wave function, we also introduced uh, uh, the momentum and the energy of the electron which, uh, according to another piece of information that is known from the theory, must be related to one another using uh, this uh, dispersion uh, relation. So basically, kinetic energy of a free particle, mv squared over 2 or p squared over 2m. Now, um, the equation itself was constructed uh, in order to uh, ensure that the plane wave function would come out as its solution and this uh, dispersion relation would be respected. And so this is uh, what equation actually looked like and uh, uh, it involved the second derivative with respect to uh, uh, the coordinate and the first derivative with respect to time. Now the next step, and this is really the first time we uh, sort of uh, thought of introducing an operator, was uh, uh, to write the equation in a different way. So we had the sort of universal left-hand side, which is just i h bar, the derivative with respect to time, uh, and the right-hand side was a sort of energy operator, the Hamiltonian, uh, where we associated with the momentum that would have appeared in the classical theory, uh, this guy, which is minus i h bar uh, gradient, which indeed is an operator that converts, uh, well, that acts on the uh, wave function. And the last step in deriving, again, in quotes, uh, the Schrodinger equation was to generalize this uh, energy operator, well, uh, called Hamiltonian, from being uh, the free uh, energy operator, which is just p squared over 2m, uh, to kinetic energy plus potential energy. And this is the fundamental Schrodinger equation, which remarkably describes all of non-relativistic quantum physics, uh, including, uh, and it describes atomic spectra and, uh, well, even many particle systems, theory of metals, theory of superconductivity, everything is contained in a compact way in this remarkable equation. And it's sort of also remarkable that you can get to it from a very few simple experimental facts uh, by adding small pieces together and getting to this fundamental result. Now, but in doing so, we were forced, indeed, to uh, introduce, uh, well, at least, at least three operators. So the first one we have seen already many times, it is the momentum operator minus i h bar uh, gradient. And by the way, I should mention that the minus sign is really sort of a convention, which is sort of must be consistent with the convention we choose to describe a plane wave, in a sense. Uh, it could have been plus, but this is the convention that we use. So, uh, apart from that, we also introduce the potential energy, which uh, uh, enters this H uh, hat. And in this uh, setup, the potential energy naturally uh, appears as just multiplication operator. So, we can think about a coordinate operator, multiplication operator, that, uh, well, there should be actually a vector here. Uh, multiplication operator that simply multiplies the wave function. And finally, the kinetic energy itself, uh, uh, sort of the first step was... Uh, appeared here, uh, and it was the second derivative with respect to uh, spatial coordinates. Now, um, it turns out that uh, the appearance of operators was not um, uh, unique just to this uh, sort of derivation of the Schrodinger equations, but sort of they pop up throughout quantum theory 
whenever we deal with uh, any um, uh, analogs of classical properties. For example, when dealing with the angular momentum that in classical theory uh, is uh, R cross P, so all we have to do to make it into an operator is to put a hat actually uh, on top of the corresponding uh, quantity. So P here will be replaced with minus I H bar gradient according to this, and R will be just multiplication operator, etc. So we can always uh, find a proper generalization of classical properties. So that's great. We established that operators uh, do appear in the mathematical formalism of quantum theory. And from the mathematical point of view, it may be quite interesting. But what physical significance do these operators really have? Unlike their classical counterparts, which can be uh, measured directly uh, in a classical experiment, let's say we can measure momentum, angular momentum, position, the operators cannot be measured per se, they are operators. So how do we uh, associate an experimental observable with them? So in order to answer this question, we're going to use a, a sort of method that oftentimes is used in science by, by first answering the question in this simple special case and then generalizing uh, the results to uh, a, a more uh, general uh, category of objects. So, uh, and the special case that we're going to consider is the measurement of a coordinate of a quantum particle. So the Born rule tells us that uh, the uh, absolute value of the wave function squared gives us the probability distribution function of different positions of a quantum particle. Now, in general, uh, if we have a probability distribution function, let's say uh, f, a capital F of x of some random uh, variable x, so if we want to find, let's say, the uh, mean value, the expectation value of this x, what we're going to do is we're going to average x integrate x over all possible uh, values weighted with this probability distribution. So by in full analogy with this, we can uh, define the mean value of uh, a three-dimensional coordinate by integrating the wave function, absolute value of wave function squared uh, with the coordinate over the uh, volume, over the basically all three-dimensional space. There is a square here. So, uh, and this is a natural definition of the mean uh, position. So we can rewrite uh, this definition as so, because psi absolute of value of psi squared, of course, is simply psi star uh, times psi of r. So now comes this generalization of uh, this definition of the expectation value of a coordinate to a general case of an arbitrary quantum mechanical operator. So let's say we have a classical uh, property X, uh, let's say momentum, angular momentum, coordinate, energy, whatever. And let's assume we know the quantum mechanical operator associated with this, some X hat. So the expectation value of uh, this uh, quantum observable X is going to be calculated in full analogy with this equation by simply replacing uh, the uh, coordinate operator in this equation with the uh, operator x, whatever it is. So for example, if x happens to be, uh, so let's say if x happens to be uh, momentum, then we're going to simply write it, the expectation value of momentum is going to be an integral of v star uh, minus i h bar gradient of psi, etc. So it turns out that this conjecture actually works in that uh, it is consistent with the experimental data uh, and the experimental data uh, implies that if, we, let's say, we have uh, an ensemble of quantum systems, each described by wave function psi of r, and if we measure uh, this quantum, some property x of these quantum systems, we're going to get different results. But uh, the average value of this measurement is going to be uh, consistent with this definition, uh, with this definition of uh, the expectation value. And uh, so it becomes a very important and basic principle of quantum mechanics that I reiterate here, namely that, first of all, physical observables are associated with uh, what I didn't discuss, self-adjoint uh, uh, operators acting on the wave function with the expectation value uh, defined uh, as above.